Hello, welcome to this week's Rugby League Back Chat. We now know what happened on relegation D-Day. London went down, we've got that to discuss, plus much, much more with this week's panel. Let me introduce you. We have the editor of League Express, Martin Sadler, the head coach of Halifax, Simon Griggs, and Huddersfield assistant coach, Willie Poaching. Gents, welcome. Uh, Martin, I'll start with you. London have gone down. It's almost a, don't want to be biased, but there is a tinge of disappointment that they couldn't Finish the, I'm sure Willie will disagree, but yeah. there is that tinge of disappointment. Well, I think I, I think a lot of people are probably a, a bit disappointed given the way they played during the year. But you know, I mean, I, I'd have been disappointed whoever went down because you, you don't really want anybody to, um, to to get relegated if you're honest. Certainly from my point of view, as as the editor of a rugby league newspaper, you want everybody to be successful. But um, I just thought on Friday night when when Wakefield, you know, Wakefield set the stall out, and in particular I thought Danny Brough set his stall out. You know, Danny Brough, he may be 36, I think, is he now? But, you know, his kicking game is still tremendous, and I thought it was on A grade on Friday night. I don't think there's any doubt, you know, that his kicking game... You found that London was starting their sets right near their own line, and having to kick on the sixth tackle just short of the halfway line quite often. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you know, you, you, you're struggling, aren't you? Let's face it. And, and I thought Brough had it on a string. Willie, you were uh, at Huddersfield, obviously, given your role. Um, how much did you know? As you were telling me that you were trying to keep yourself in the dark during the game. Yeah. So what, what were you aware of and not aware of in terms of everywhere else? Not a lot, mm. if any. Um, we learned a lesson the week before when we played St Helens and, and Hulk AR. We were playing against London. And we understood the ramifications of that result. So it was a little bit of cheering. And whilst I wasn't aware, but I think there were some of our players looking at their phones during the game. The non-players, that is. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to keep tabs on it. And when we finished, that game was still going. Mm -hmm. And at that time, when we came off the field, I think Hulk Howe were in front. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they ended up losing with the guys watching. And there was just dejection in the dressing room. But we were still in charge of what was going to happen of our fate. We was, our destiny was still in our hands. So that was the attitude going into Friday night was don't worry about the other games. Don't mm -hmm. worry about the results. Don't look at what's happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Let's just put all our energy, not just this week, but on Friday night into the Catalan game and solely focus, on, solely focus on that. I will be honest, with about 15 minutes to go and we're losing by eight. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody in the crowd say that Wakey were up 18 nil or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there was a little bit of, oh, we're all right. <laughs> and then somebody on our bench said, oh, should we tell the players? I said, no way. No way, don't just, just let them play. They're going to be fine. And as it's turned out, the players got the win and they finished the result strongly. So, as I said, destiny was in our own hands and we just had to focus on that and not be distracted by what was going on at Wakefield or at Salford. Actually, it would have been really exciting, wouldn't it, if, if the... Wakefield London game had been really close, you know, if, if they'd been even going to the I last don't think Willie five or ten minutes. Because what was really interesting was that you came from behind and won in the end, and Hull Kingston Rovers were winning but lost right at the end, didn't they? And, you know, if that had been really crucial, gosh, that would have been so incredible. But um, because Wakefield built up that lead, it, it just took away the tension on the evening, I think. Yeah, and I understand. I think at half time of all three games, the scores were quite close. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. So for a fan, I can understand how exciting it must have been, still Absolutely. not knowing. And, and everybody involved with the game would have been on tension. And so oh, we still don't know at half time. Yeah. Um, I remember through the game, I had to run to the toilet and there was some people, staff of the ground, they were checking the scores. And I, <laughs> I was slightly tempted to ask what's going on. Yeah. But I, no, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what's going on. <laughs> and ran back out and had to get back to focusing on our game. But yeah, it's all worked out well for Huddersfield. And, yeah, unfortunate for London. I, I, I think they've been successful this year. Mm -hmm. They've exceeded everybody's expectations. I didn't give Danny Ward too many chances of winning three or four games, mm -hmm. let alone ten. Uh, it is a shame that they've gone down, but you know, we knew at the start of the year that somebody was going to go, and, and it's probably nailed on at the start of the year with the punters and with the bookies that they were the favourites from the outset. But they, they've given it a real good shout. and mm. You know, they gave everyone a scare right to the last day. Well, Simon, when you played against them last year on, on the field, they went up, you know them better than any of us would have done. Did you think in your wildest dreams they could be as competitive and win 10 games in Super League going up? Uh, I think 10 probably surprised everyone, but no, I certainly thought they'd be competitive because they play 
a brand that suits them. Um, you know, a lot of lads who go play down there against um, the London down there, they'll tell you that it's quite a difficult place to play. Um, you know, the markings on the pitch are a bit, the rugby union markings and so on. It just it's a bit off-putting, bit of a strange, bit of a strange place. And they play that pitch really well. So I always thought there'd be a chance at home. Um, but obviously they've picked a few people off along the way as well. But I think the foundations of that team have been getting built over time um, since obviously. Uh, Henderson was there before and then Danny's Danny Ward's gone in and done a great job of him as well and I think he's a bit of a character as well you can see they're happy in the rugby and they've all been proud to play for play for the Broncos and I'm sure this is not the end for London they'll they'll bounce back they are losing a lot I'm of sure. players Simon aren't they you know and they're, they're gonna have to rebuild again to a certain degree and obviously they were doing that in the championship but I mean presumably you're expecting them to be ultra competitive in the championship next yeah they'll year. lose some but the, I think London is still an attractive club to play for, so it's not mm. like they're going to struggle um, getting players. The only thing, the only issue I see with it coming down to the last game and relegation, promotion, so on, is is them have they got the time to get organised and mm. and recruit the players they want um, based on this time of year when everyone's generally done done their business. Mm. They do have the academy though, don't they, Matt? I mean, we're looking at the academy league team. They finished fifth. Did London? That's that strikes me as a pretty big news story. That that London. Can yeah, that. I think the only academy teams ahead of them are Wigan, Warrington, Saints, and Leeds, aren't yeah. they? Which is really quite remarkable. You know, I went actually. to watch them against Giants. I've seen you there, didn't I? Against their 19s, and they're a pretty solid team. Um, I, think, I think over the last few years they've had pretty good academy teams. They've always been competitive, and a lot of athletes. Um, we've probably a short time in rugby league. Um, so they are they're producing some good kids, and a few of them are making their way through the first team now, which is good, and that'll. That'll be something they'll probably have to lean on moving forward as well. I understand some of the, the sentiments of Robert Alston and the importance that London plays mm -hmm. in our game in this country. It's such a big market for our game as far as numbers, especially at the junior level playing. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. huge. And it's understated how, how big the game is because it's so spread out down in London. Yeah. And it's not all around the Ealing area where the Broncos are faced, uh, placed. They don't understand, a lot of people don't see how big the game really is mm -hmm. underneath. So the the fact that the academy side at Broncos is doing so well or probably a little bit overachieving is, is not surprising because they have got some really good kids. Mm. And you go back a little while a little while ago when they were in Super League before and they didn't do so well, but they went down. A lot of those guys that have come from that team have all been successful. The guys like mm. Tony Club, Lou McCarthy, Scarsbrook, mm -hmm. Sargents, and yeah. uh, Dennis Solomona when he went to to Castleford. You know those yeah. guys. So they've always been a production line, if not for themselves, but for other clubs in the long run. I've got to say, I always really like it. Um, maybe it's just a quirk of mine, but I always really like it when a, a player gets interviewed on Sky, for example, and he speaks with a Southern accent or a Midlands accent or somewhere other than the north of England because it just it's just a sign isn't it that the game is growing and attracting these kids you know players like Matt Davis at Warrington from comes from Leicester mm. and you know all the guys who play for London you know Matt, Mike McMeekin you know come I can't remember where he comes from but somewhere somewhere you know that, that, that's pretty exotic. Basingstoke for is it? Basingstoke that's yeah. right you know it's great it's great when you see that isn't it that, mm. that, that the game can appeal to kids from a much wider geographical area than it used to be the case. Let, let's get into Robert Elston's comments about London. I don't know how Huddersfield, Wakefield and um, Hull KR would have felt about it, but he almost said that he was disappointed London had gone down, said the vibrant dynamic, he wants them in Super League. What did you, what did you read into that comment? Well, the, the fact is that London being in Super League adds to the value of a broadcasting contract for Super League. In just the same way, if you look at an interesting example overseas. In Aussie Rules Football, which I follow quite a lot, many years ago they expanded into Sydney, the city of Sydney. It was always a Melbourne game. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they established the Sydney Swans in Sydney. And they reckon now that even though Sydney Swans don't get great TV viewing figures, nobody in New South Wales watches Aussie Rules on TV all that much, but they add 40% to the value of their broadcasting contract by having a team in Sydney. And it's the same with us potentially in London. If you're not in London, in this country, you're not anywhere, are you? Let's mm. face it. You know, you're not regarded as a major, a major sport. I mean, you know, we see American football trying to establish all these games in London, playing at these massive stadiums. 
And ultimately, if, if I were Rob Elston, I would be wanting London Broncos to ultimately share the ground of Brentford Football Club. They're moving into a new ground very soon, Brentford, in, in West London, a ground of about, I don't know, it's probably it holds about 18,000 when it's completed. You know, ultimately the ambition has to be to have a London Rugby League club also playing in a stadium like that and attracting crowds that justify a move like that. Well, because ultimately, you know, trail finders, you know, it's a, it's a great little stadium for them in, in their own way as they are at the moment. Mm. But they've got to have ambition to grow beyond it. Well, here's the thing. We've talked about London coming up from the championship and doing a great job. He's also said he doesn't want loop fixtures, but they'll be staying next year. It's obvious why we don't want loop fixtures. So is it just time that we go to 14 teams? Have we got the player pool to do that now? And the, and the clubs that can viably compete at Super League as well? I, I, personally, I, I don't think we've got enough players of, of the right quality. Um, I think this year, Super League's been quite close. Really, normally it's, you know, there's a real separation between the, the top and the bottom. It's been a little bit closer. But the top four teams are still way out in front, aren't they? Um, I think if if we could get consecutive years of the teams probably switching positions and it all being a little bit closer, yeah, then there might be an argument for it. But I think at present, personally, I'm an advocate for the promotion relegation. It gives championships something to aspire to. Um, but yeah, I think stretching it out, I'm not sure it'd be in the interest of the game anyway. And then you'd be thinking you're going to dilute the better players of leaving the championship and going up. And then also, the up and down is probably going to be the same teams coming up and down as mm. well. So I'm not I'm not sold on making it bigger. Pros and cons to every league. Well, I disagree suppose. with that, uh, Simon, because ultimately the, the problem with Super League is that when you've only got 12 clubs in a competition, people can get bored of that very quickly. And again, you know, you, you see this in other competitions elsewhere. People don't get bored with football because there are 20 teams in the Premiership. There, there, are, always, there are always new teams coming into the football Premiership. When you've only got 12, I, I think 12 is too few and we ought to move to 14 in 2021. Yeah. Actually, uh, the, the point about 2021 is there's a World Cup at the end of the year. We, we need fewer fixtures in that year uh, to create some space for preparation for the World Cup. And if there were 14 teams in Super League in that year, that would be 26 fixtures, wouldn't it? And maybe with a magic weekend to make it 27. And, you know, you'd be two fewer than you, you, you have now. And you wouldn't have any loop fixtures. I understand Mock. your argument. Sorry, Will. Uh, but I think football's a different beast. It's, it's totally different. I think mean, people haven't got bored, bored of the NRL with 16 teams, have they? No, 16 is, is fine. You know, but they've got 16 teams, really, over time. They've all been competitive. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. One stage or another. That's because it's obviously a big sport in their country. The salary cap's greater, therefore people get squeezed out because the quality of play is higher than the yeah. quality of play and moves along, so everyone's reasonably strong too. The fact is, I was watching, um, you know, Lee and Featherstone playing that, you know, tremendous championship playoff game on Sunday, and that game was as exciting as any Super League game. And to the casual observer, you, you wouldn't really be able to see clearly that that game wasn't of a Super League standard, you know, because it was a game between two pretty evenly contested sides. I think sides. it becomes doing it every you know, week is what the... Uh, that, well, that my, is a, that is my a test. My concern with growing the teams and a bit of what Simon's saying is the quality of the product that we deliver. And that doesn't reflect itself. Just because the scoreline is close doesn't mean the game is good. Doesn't mean it's a quality game. You know, I, I, I think the standard... Super League has, has dropped the last couple of years from what it has been and some of that has been through the quality of player that we're able to attract from Australia and the difference in the discrepancy in the salary cap and what we're able to challenge with and the type of player that we're bringing over now. Yeah, but, but Willie, there are two separate issues. One is the standard of play and it may or may not have dropped. That's certainly debatable. But the second thing is entertainment value. And entertainment value doesn't necessarily depend on the standard. It depends on equally contested matches and that's I think Super League this year mm. has been at its most entertaining. Yeah, maybe, maybe for I the really person going that. to the game, I, yeah, I agree, yeah. the guy that yeah. goes to the game but as far as Robert Elston is concerned and the TV, the, the people that watch the game from the outside, I think what we have as a game are fantastic athletes, Absolutely. beautiful rules and, and a free-flowing game that is full of full contact. That's what people want to see. Absolutely. I'm not sure if we're Seeing that every single week. I think the argument that has to be decided, isn't it, is whether we have 
the quality of players that can go across 14 teams and ensure that entertainment product stays exactly the same. That seems to be the, the general Well, the problem, p- part of the problem is, though, we've got such a long season, you know, mm. 29 games plus Challenge Cup plus playoffs and so on and so forth. The Part of the problem has always been, I think, with Rugby League that, that the squads are, you know, probably too small, really, because you end up with a lot of players playing with knocks that they've picked up and so on, niggles and so on. I mean, you obviously know far more about that than I do because you're involved with clubs but it, it, it does strike me that you know t- we're expecting an awful lot of our players to play for such a long period of time and Rob Elston did make that point yeah. he wants a shorter season mm-hmm. I'm totally with him on that I think absolutely correct Martin let me stop you there because we are going to have to have a quick break that's all we've got time for in this first part after the break we'll speak about that and much much more including Toronto and if they will be allowed into Super League we'll be right back You've spoken and we've listened. Rugby League Back Chat is available on podcast form from all your best podcast providers. If you're on a trip down the M62 or a flight to Toronto or Toulouse, download Rugby League Back Chat for the best debate inside Rugby League. Welcome back to Rugby League Back Chat. Before the break, we were talking about salary caps, Matt, and you were on about you want bigger squads, so just carry on with what you were saying. Well, I think, it, you know... When we've got such a long season, the, the, the size of the squad, to me, is linked to the length of the season. You know, the longer the season, the bigger the, the bigger the squad you need. So, obviously, if we reduce the season by two or three games or even more, which I think we ought to do, you, then the current sw- squad sizes will probably be OK. So, you know, people, people, a lot of clubs seem to say that we need 29 games in order to, you know, generate the income that we need to... You know, to pay the squads we've got, but but actually, if you reduce the number of games, uh, I don't think their income would fall dramatically. In fact, I think there'd be a a, a sort of counter uh, trend of bigger attendances for the games that that there would be, because I think people, I, I don't think the fans really like these loop fixtures, for example, mm. seeing a t- uh, the same game twice uh, in the s- same season at their own ground. You know, the top clubs are playing each other too often. I think that's the point. So, so you know, big matches, for example, Wigan Saints, the Hull Derby, those sort of games, they're being overexposed. But and, he, and if you get overexposed, just, you, you, you you tend to Just to pick up people. on something you said there, though, about if you're going to have the bigger squad, if you're going to have a longer season, you need bigger squads, and that includes bigger salary cap. But we've already got in Super League this year, London don't spend up to cap, Salford don't yeah, spend sure. up to cap, Wakefield don't spend up to cap. There might be more. Mm. Could clubs afford to, even if they could spend more, could they afford to do that anyway? Well, probably not. But, you know, the, you've always got to um, be very careful that you don't just make progress at the speed of the slowest, haven't you? You can't. Mm. You can't tailor everything, you know, just because of the fact that the one or two clubs. Right, I'm taking you. To, I'm taking you to task here now, then. <laughs> but you want 14 teams. Yeah. Now, if you did that, you'd have two other. Let's say Toronto went up and they could spend, but whoever else came up with them couldn't spend up to cap either. So then you'd. Well, be, I think that I think would Toulouse probably could again, do, couldn't they? Toulouse, Toulouse, if they came up, could probably spend up to cap. I would think. Mm. Out of I don't know about their financial situation in detail, um, but but there will always be. Probably, I mean, you know, it, it, it's always. A problem, um, if you see it as a problem, but in my view, the bigger problem is that, um, that that Super League is just too small at the moment and needs that extra variety of uh, at least a couple more clubs. So I think, you know, you always find that people adjust to whatever the situation is. And I think with 14 teams, I, I've, I've got no doubt that we'd have an, a viable competition just as we've had this year. A couple of issues from me. On, on some of this is one, it's the salary cap. That's not a salary cap. A salary cap for mine is where everyone in the competition has the same amount to spend. Sure. And there's a level playing field. And that's 
what I see as being a salary cap, and this is why other sports, i.e. the American sports and the NRL and the AFL, as you say, because they all have the same amount to spend, it's a level playing field. Mm -hmm. And this is when you start to get a rotation or a cycle of winners. Sure. And each team has a period of where they have success. Whilst we don't have that, we will always have the top because they're allowed to spend more yeah, than, they than the bottom. Too, too well, because players, they have, yeah. Regardless whether they've got an, an owner that's got a whole lot of money, they mm. still get to spend more. So that's not a salary cap for mm. me. Mm. But what you're saying as well about bigger squads, mm. the difficulty for coaches and for people managing the caps is the value for money for players. You know, whatever, whatever player you bring in, you want value for that money. Of course. Yeah. And, you know, you've got to manage that with your marquee if you have them or your top enders and how much do you give those bottom enders that will fill in every now and again. How, what's their value? If they're going to be full-time, obviously, you've got, to, they've got to, you've got to pay them a certain amount, yeah. Yeah. whatever that I'd, is, I'd minimum wage yeah. if that's the case. But, you know, not every club has that. I'd love to carry on this conversation, but we have got more to discuss and we're almost halfway through the show now, so we're going to have to move on. Uh, you said you want variety in Super League. We are going to guarantee have a new name in Super League next season. Yeah, absolutely. Ferriston beat Leeds. Well, we think so, don't we? I mean, Well, no, what, we, we what, will what, because Toronto, yeah, Toulouse, York, Feb, never what, been in Super but, League. But let's assume that Toronto win yeah. the, 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 the championship title. Mm -hmm. But then, for some reason, the RFL and Super League say they don't pass minimum standards, whatever they are. What happens then? Well, do London stay in Super League? I don't mean, ask me. I'm the host. I'm <laughs> asking you. But it, Robert Elson's come out and said that they're seeking assurances from the RFL. I mean, that would be staggered what? if Toronto, you know, ultimately won the promotion final, but but weren't admitted to Super League. I'd be, I'd find that absolutely amazing, mm. and that, you know, it's almost not worth considering. But but while this this bit of a cloud hangs over them in a way, doesn't it? And um, it, that needs to be sorted out as soon as possible, and certainly before the before the playoffs go very much further. Well, Simon, I was I hate to use the phrase "typical rugby league," but <laughs> Toronto could be promoted in two weeks' time, and we're still saying we're not sure whether they'll be yes. allowed in. So I think it's been odds on they're going to be going up. Can you yeah, see anyone I'll... beating them? No, okay. not in not so, in Toronto. I think I think Toulouse on the day have got. Some pretty special players in Corella and Ford who can mm. can pull some tricks out, but now I think it, across the board in terms of consistency, that like, Toronto have been the best team, and I can't see that changing between now and the end. Um, but you're probably right; it's typical rugby league. They've been odds on for a while, mm. and now we're discussing the viability of them potentially being in Super League uh, when obviously they would have been preparing for it themselves. Um, I, I'd love to know what the minimum standards are. I don't think <laughs> anyone's, there's a lot of different stadiums, different yeah. setups across our competition, and I don't think I've ever heard what minimum standards are. I mean, does the minimum are, so. standard just apply to the stadium, or are they talking about something else? Are they talking about the management of the club? I don't think it's the staging, because Robert Elston said that he was asked how it compares to Toulouse and the assurances is, that they've so, sought from them. And they said he said something on the lines of that, meaning to paraphrase him, because of the travel, it's not as difficult with Toulouse. So it clearly s suggests that it's related to the travel challenges that clubs will face. Mm. But my argument is no one's moaned about this when part-time clubs in League One and the Championship have had to do it. So hey, you've you've done it, Sam. Why, why should it be an issue to Super League clubs? I would have thought it'd be a non-issue, to be honest. Like mentioned off camera about the fact they won't be taking any central funding and so on. So there's money saved there for Super League. And if, Absolutely. You know, if they had to top top up the clubs to help them out in that regard with the travel and the length of time they stay there uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't really be an issue and if you ask if you ask the fans of super league clubs do they fancy a trip to canada my suspicion is that a lot of them Possibly. will say definitely in summer yeah. in summer yes exactly. it's a good day it was a good yeah. experience we went um, you went to niagara falls i imagine went to the falls yeah we managed to stay we the lads paid to stay longer rather than go sort of smash and grab try get in and get out as quick as you can we stayed and it was a good experience and the setup was good and um, we were looked after pretty well. Um, I'd presume most Super League teams would probably want to get there early and do a bit of training there and, and get into it rather than just, obviously we've, we've looked with uh, sorry, the, the French teams, you're able to just go potentially on the day. I, I don't know if Giants do that, but I know a lot of clubs do flying in the morning, play the afternoon, come back. Obviously that's not, that's not going to happen there, but I would imagine, yeah, 
they'll want to spend a bit of time there and they'll want to know that they're going to be looked after and things are going to be done properly, which from what I saw there, I, I presume that's, that'll be the case for them. I mean, Willie, even if, I don't know if there's any agreement where Toronto is saying we won't be paying for flights or whatever. I, I don't know that, I don't have that info, but there's 1.8 million, I think, you get a central funding. Well, if that's split between 11 clubs, would that not cover the cost anyway of travelling out to Toronto? I mean, you, roughly? We try to work well, out possibly, head, but possibly but it depends it, on the, yeah. the individual but, club and how they want to spend it. Yeah. You've also got to look at Catalan and you may be going there twice or you may be going yeah. to Toronto twice with these loop fixtures. So. You could technically do Toronto twice, Catalan twice in one year, couldn't you, with the loop fixtures? Exactly. Technically. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is, you know, our sport is always a short term, it, there's far too much short term thinking. This business, for example, about the 1.8 million going mm. spare, if if um, if Toronto get promoted and then don't don't share in the central distribution, you know the, the reaction of the clubs itself. Well, we'll just share that between the rest of us. Then in that case, yeah. there's a tremendous opportunity there. It seems to me for Super League to invest that 1.8 million in and improving the marketing and promotion and everything to do with Super League to really give it a strong presence in, in you know in, in in the eyes of the public not just in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom but in in obviously in Canada and in France and everywhere else besides but instead of doing that the clubs say well we'll just share the money out and we'll buy another Australian player I think that's just ridiculous I think it you know we don't deserve to be successful when we make no. decisions like that if I'm really honest about you're it. you're quite passionate about that Willie aren't you about overseas players coming over and how it doesn't seem to be beneficial for the game over here. We spoke about this before. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do see the value. And I was mm. one of the overseas players that came across here. Mm -hmm. So I, I do see the importance. One of the average ones. Yeah. <laughs> well, some of the importance pretty, of pretty good of one, mate. <laughs> to come good. across here and, and give a lot to the game. Mm. You know, there are some really good ones. But you know, we just can't invest the money that we would do in a top liner. And, and an average player, the, the quota player coming over, that's that's a golden ticket. Mm -hmm. And you've got to get, as I said before, you've got to be looking at value for money. And some of them are coming over on big money. Most of them are in big packages. You can house in a car and a lot of them are coming with their families. And so that's a big chunk of, mm. of the cap going away. And for that, you've got to deliver. You've mm -hmm. got to, that's your responsibility as an overseas player taking up that spot. I'm not sure if they're delivering up to some of that. Well, Damien Irvin was on this show last week and he was very critical of, you know, too many overseas signings mm -hmm. by, by clubs. And I think he's absolutely <coughs> right. You know, you've, you've got to be incredibly selective, I think, when you, whether you're picking a marquee player or, or, or any other overseas player, you know, it's, it doesn't work every time. And the problem is that if it doesn't work, it's costing you an awful lot of money, isn't it? You yeah. know, it, it's an expensive mistake. Whereas to, to sign a young academy star, you know, to, like, for example, uh, Callum McClelland, uh, uh, the Leeds player, mm -hmm. had a great game for Featherston on Sunday at Lee. And I don't know what money he's on, but you can guarantee it's going to be a hell of a lot less than most of the other overseas players at this stage of his career. Yeah, I think the, the coaches, the clubs, the judge on what they do now, though, aren't they? That's why they end up going overseas at times. But back to your previous comments about could that money be better spent? I think I think it Robert Elson who said we need to make Super League players the stars of the game and have Absolutely. them as household names. I think you're dead right with the fact that that money could be spent pushing rugby league out there and getting you know more TV coverage or whatever it might be and actually getting to know the personalities and there's some real characters in our game and they don't yes. get showcased enough. This is a thing. I'm you know, speaking from doing this show, the amount, some of the plays you get on, you never ever see them in the media, ever. And then they come on here and they're great. And it, you're always wondering why we don't promote the guys. And everyone, we do radio together, Willie, and some of the people you get on there are great. It's like, why, why don't well, I don't we want to be, I don't want to be cynical, them? Matthew, but I know that there are some people in the game running certain clubs who tend to say, we don't want to build up our players as big personalities because then they'll just want more money from us. You know, so let's let's but, keep a, let's but, keep a lid on but it. But surely, which surely, is pathetic. Really, right, let's take Anthony Gellin. Yeah, because he's the first one that springs to mind. Surely, he is an investment for a club. Because look at all the media marketing he's done for for witnesses. Yeah, yeah, all right. He he might be a bit daft, and he, I I don't really know him personally. But surely, he's a character. Just, yeah, of course he. Is. But, yeah, and some of the things that he'll do, you'll roll your eyes at, no doubt. But surely, he has a marketing value 
which which makes well, I think, want to be a I think a lot of players have a marketing value, but but we don't really try to exploit it, do we? Yeah, but in, why? In, in the why? right way. Well, I've, you ask, you tell me. I don't. You know, the, the the people who run the game. I just. I mean, I, I think Rob Elston understands this fully, mm. and and wants to change the culture so that it so that rugby league. Rugby league marketing and promotion does become much more player centered, which I think it has to do. Mm. Um, because if you think about any sport, you know, you think about, when I think about football, I think about somebody like Harry Kane, for example, or someone like that, you know, the top players. I don't necessarily always think about the clubs, but you think, you know, if, 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 if Harry Kane's playing, that might persuade me to watch a football game. If, if it's somebody I've never heard of, I'm much less likely to. Uh, and it's the same with uh, other sports as well. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it, it's crucial. Uh, what you'd find is if we did some research and you actually went and asked people throughout the country, do you recognise this leading rugby league player? You know, whoever it might be, whether it's Sam Tompkins, Tommy Makinson, you know, wh whoever. Um, the vast majority of people wouldn't recognise them, wouldn't, sure wouldn't know them. No. And that's... Right. And that's that's the problem the, the game faces. Simon can walk for Halifax and not get spoiled. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, cap on. well they're, the, yeah. they're the greatest marketers of our game. Of course they're they are. the most important marketers, both on the field and their individual branding. Because mm -hmm. you say, we've got some great characters, we've got some great people who do great things in our communities. Mm -hmm. And we don't, for my mind, shout from the rooftops enough about some of the good stuff they do. Mm -hmm. As soon as somebody trips up, we're all over it. Yeah, but some of the guys that um, we've got people at Huddersfield, and uh, I did something a little while ago with with some of the wakey lads who do prison visits, and they've been doing it all year, mm -hmm. helping some of the young offenders and those sort of things. I think we should be selling to the world about how Definitely. great our players are, and that's yeah. just a, a tidbit I, I, I of what our agree. players do. We work for the same company. I did not know that, and we work as a media like that. That for me is a great story, but that doesn't seem to get thrown out enough, does it, Martin? No, really? I don't think it does. You know, a, 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 a lot of clubs, but part of the problem these days with clubs is that, 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 that they don't send stuff out to the media generally because far too many clubs now just focus on their own social media. Mm. You know, so that, for example, a club will have its own website, its own Twitter account and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and they're not speaking to the wider public. They're only speaking to their own fans. And I think that's one of the problems. If you only ever speak to your own fans, you never expand your fan base because you're let only me, speaking let, to the guys yeah. who are there. Let's now. wrap that up there because we do have to have another break. I keep interrupting you. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. I get bored of listening that's, to you. Thank you much. <laughs> Final part of Rugby League Back Chat Incoming where we'll be speaking about the playoffs at all three tiers. We'll be right back. You've spoken and we've listened. Rugby League Back Chat is available on podcast form from all your best podcast providers. If you're on a trip down the M62 or a flight to Toronto or Toulouse, download Rugby League Back Chat for the best debate inside Rugby League. Hello, welcome back for the final part of this week's Rugby League Back Chat from the LD Nutrition Stage. And we spoke about a lot so far in this show. If you want to get your say, tell us on Twitter at RL Backchat. Right, gents, playoff time. Um, normally I'd ask who you think is going to win it at the end, but I'm going to switch it round. I'm going to ask you who you think is going to win it at the start, and I want you to tell me why. Simon, Super League playoff winners. Who's going to win at Old Trafford? I've got a sneaky feeling we're going to have a good chance. And I can hear groans around <laughs> the country as uh, you say that. Why? Why we're good? Just a big game experience, and they've been peaking at the right end of the year, you know, for numerous years now. And they look to be getting a few bodies back, and they look like they're playing some confident rugby now. So, yeah, I think that's that's, that's my my view at the minute. Willie's nodding. Yeah, I'm with him. We're going. Yeah. I just 
get that feeling it's that time of year when they just seem to find form. They know how to play this time of year and what's required. Um, watching O'Loughlin come back again, he's missed most of the year as he does most mm. years and you know, he's, he's fit again and primed <laughs> and ready to go. Um, Tommy Luluai, um, but they've got some young great kids in Partington and Smithies who've been fantastic this year. Mm. They're just babies, but they've played like seasoned veterans, the mm. way they go out there and dish it out and put their bodies through so much and disregard for opposition, yeah. senior players. I, I just think there's something about Wigan at this moment. They seem full of confidence, and I like the way they're playing. And a few a few weeks ago, nobody would have said Wigan, would they? Um, Wigan, you know, were edging their way up the table, but nobody really thought that they'd, they'd be in a position to really challenge St. Helens. Everybody thought St. Helens were walk, walking away with it. And mm -hmm. the fact that Saints lost in the Challenge Cup final and, you know, messed up in a big game like that, I think makes everybody else think that it can happen again, don't they? You know, it, St. Helens are by no means certainties. I still think St. Helens will win the grand final, though, because okay. I think they've, I think they'll learn their, I think Justin Holbrook is a, a really smart coach, and I think they'll learn their lesson from, from that Challenge Cup final defeat. And, and it's interesting what you were saying about, you know, Wigan have got the big game experience, but then you cited all these young players, you know, Morgan Smith is who's our Albert Goldthorpe Rookie of the Year this year. Players like Liam Byrne, Oliver Partington and so on. Those guys actually don't really have the big game experience because they're all no, such, I think I'm such sorry, young players. Aaron Tawans, but the club, what Willie was saying, Tommy yeah, Lulawai. Yeah. Um, and Sean O'Loughlin who I think years ago now when I think we, uh, it was Warrington, we played him in the grand final and he, he played the semi in the final in the eight weeks you know, prior, <laughs> prior to doing it and it turned out the grand final is Wigan's yeah, yeah. Talisman, do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yes. um, I think having those blokes fit at the right time of the year is important. And they've had the trouble this year. Everyone was, yeah. they were writing them off when they had so many injuries and a lot of good young kids coming through, having to play probably before the time. Yeah. And now we're talking about them as you know, rookies of the year because of what they've done in that period. Can, can we talk about these three? Because I want to set up a fan club and be the chairman of it for those three young lads because they're brilliant. They show no regard for re reputation of other players. They're just knocking Liam Watts all over the joint on Thursday. It was great to see. They'll probably get the comeuppance at some point. Probably not great to see for Liam Watts, I would No, think. no, I, nothing against Liam Watts. He's been tremendous and deserves his place in the dream team. Yeah. Willie, it, isn't it great to see three young lads just ruffling feathers and, and winding people up like they're doing at the minute and and really putting the foot down. For sure, it is. And it's exciting to watch. Mm. And it's been a trademark of the Wigan club, you know, forever. Bringing young, strong forwards. Talk about O'Loughlin when he first came in and then Stephen Wilde. And then it was uh, Liam Farrell. Gaz yeah. Hawk and people yeah. like that. You know, the production line from their academy to coming through and they've not only trusted the young fellas to step up, those young fellas have always repaid the club and, and these guys are doing exactly that. Tell you what's interesting though from, you know, as I, as I see it, <coughs> earlier in the season, you know, Wigan parted company with two forwards, Gabe Hamlin and, and Talima Tautai, um, for indiscretions away from the pitch. If that hadn't happened, if, if those two guys hadn't broken whatever rules they broke, Presumably they'd have still been here, and you wonder whether all these young guys would have been getting the chances they've had. But, you know, because I always tend to think with with young players, a, a young player to get an opportunity needs somebody either to get injured or to depart the club, because normally a coach will tend to stick with more experienced guys. It's inevitable, I, I, I guess. But Adrian Lamb has had to, you know, dip into his youngsters at Wigan. And it's paid enormous dividends. And uh, incidentally, I, I was also a bit surprised to see Adrian Lamb not included among the four-man shortlist for Coach of the Year. So I think he's actually done a great job well, this year. Um, uh, let's move guys. the conversation on to a club I want to talk about now, Salford, because Coach of the Year, Simon, only one candidate really, is there? Ian Watson? I think so, yeah. Based on what he's done with, with the team, uh, listen, the names on paper don't always count. I think Salford are, are really proving that this year. Jackson Hastings has obviously been very pivotal in, in what they've achieved this year, but to take Salford from where they were last year to third, mm. I think is um, a really big achievement and you know one they'll all be really proud of and it's not over for them yet. They've got they've got some opportunities to 
look, they're a bit like the London now in the playoff scenario where they haven't got anything to lose. Mm -hmm. Everyone would have said at the beginning of the year they'll be in the, the bottom part where the teams, you know, Hull KR and, and Huddersfield have been. Um, so now they've got nothing to lose and they should all be really proud. But it's nice to see a young British coach mm -hmm. um, be in the mix for that as well and get some, get some recognition. Can they win it, will they? If, if they can stay fit and healthy, um, anything can happen. I, I think such as the danger that Jackson Hastings presents. But that left edge of theirs is so dangerous, especially when they have uh, Chris Nanunu there, outside of Josh Jones, who's had a fantastic year as well. Yeah. You know, his combination <coughs> with Jackson Hastings has been phenomenal. And any time we've had to do some homework and play against them, now that's been a big focus, and I'm sure most teams are the same in their prep. I was speaking to Danny Ward, and he said they were the best team that they faced this year. I mean, that's a look at how good Saints have been. That's a pretty big compliment. It's know. a massive test for them, though, isn't it? On Friday at, at Wigan, you know, it, it's really going to be a challenge for Salford, and 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 I mean they've won eight games in a row, so it's clearly one yeah. that they could and Wigan rise have won, to. And, Wigan have won twelve out of thirty. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's it's a real. I mean, it's the two form teams of Super League playing, really, to be to to, to be honest about it, with the trip to St. Helens awaiting the winner. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be one of the most fascinating games for a long time, I think, this game. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it. And, you know, I, I hope Salford, you know, well, I don't know, so I'm saying I hope Salford win, but I hope it's a real tight game and, you know, whoever does win, you know, pulls it off in the last two minutes because mm -hmm. I think we'd love to see a game like that, wouldn't we? Further down the pecking order, Warrington. I'd be amiss not to ask you, Sam, about Warrington. What what have you made of their season? I think they've had, if you look at it right now, I think they've had a pretty good season overall. Obviously, winning the Cup's a highlight, mm -hmm. but I think in Super League, they've lost some games that, I mean, Steve Price, yeah, I'm sure he said it in the press, that they shouldn't have lost some of those games, whether that's just the you know, subconscious turning up thinking, you know, you're going to turn over a lead when, when really the standing in the table suggests you should. Um, but that's rugby league. If you don't turn up and, and execute, um, you can get turned over, which is what we were saying with, with Salford there, that they're a really good team. Um, talking about St. Helens, um, when I think of St. Helens, probably the individual names start jumping out, you know, Coote and Makins and so on. Whereas other than Hastings, no disrespect to Salford players, they've got some really good players in there, but I would describe them as a really good team. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why they're in there because their consistency they've had all the time. But I think Warren that inconsistency is pro inconsistency is probably an issue. Um, and they're running, you know, it'll be dependent on whether they can get Blake Austin backfiring as well. He's been really important for them, and you know, really turning up on game day, which is what the important bit is. I want to ask you about Blake Austin. I remember the start of this season. You were talking about Warrington, and they'd never truly replaced Lee Breers, who obviously you played with for many many years. Has Blake Austin been? The answer has I he think, been the nearest they've got? I think so. Mm. Um, I thought I think he is. Um, Breezy not only as a as a character, um, but you know his skill set that he brought to the game, and every club generally has has a talisman over time, and Breezy certainly was that. And I think we looked. You always look to him in the big games and so on, and he came up with that play. And you know, for a time there when he went because he went like that, it wasn't. A progressive, he faded out the team. He was still playing really well when he when he called it quits. Uh, it was Lee, and you know, it took a bit of time and some personnel change and so on in between. But yeah, I think in Blake Austin, they found someone equally as confident and probably equally as gifted on the pitch as well. And that confidence, much like Leeds and Leeds had with Peacock and Wigan have with O'Loughlin, Brazy give you that confidence. And I think that they've got that in, in Blake Austin. And as I say, I think if he can get back fit and firing. They are a chance. Um, it was interesting, though, that they won the Challenge Cup without him. Um, yeah. and, and I thought that was significant because the trouble with having a player like Blake Austin and, and Lee Breers before him is that sometimes you become over-reliant yes. on, those, on those guys. And, you know, there's a, there's a tendency to say, well, you know, Blake's going to run the show, which is a fairly natural thing to think. Yeah. Um, but when it's not there, everybody, everybody else realises they've got to, you know, pull together and do a lot more and find a different way to win. And Warrington did that superbly at Wembley, I thought. And, and the thing is that about the, the, the club that wins the Challenge Cup final, it's amazing how often they struggle after they've won it, you know, for the remainder of the season. You know, m maybe they think they've achieved what they were going to achieve. And I, I don't know what it is, but, you know, Warrington have dropped to fourth. They're in a, a position now where they can't afford to lose mm -hmm. on Thursday. If they lose, they're out. 
So it's really I think different. you're right on the reliance part of, of a, a, a player such as Blake Austin, but I think the first 40 minutes of the, the Challenge Cup final, arguably the best uh, team performance I've seen for quite a while. But I think when you get to these big, these, the grand final, um, in the in the running towards that, you've got you need you need the cream in your team as well to really stand up, and I think he provides. You that need that X factor, don't yeah, you? I think he's, mm. he's the X factor who can come up with that. I mean, that uh, ball you've got to say that it. you know if Blake is going to really do it, Old Trafford would be a great stage to do it on, wouldn't he? You know, Old Trafford is built for players like him in a way because you you want to see he's he's, he's brilliant with the ball, he's brilliant on his feet, he's he's got this ability to run and change direction at pace and so on, yes. which, which, which is his strength, I think. Um, and, you know, if, if we're going to see that at Old Trafford, that would, that would make it a special day. That's his danger. He's, he's got yeah. every thread. He's got a kicking thread. He mm. can step off both feet. Both mm. feet. He's strong. Well, he's a big and he's body quick. Well. He is a big body. He's, he's, a, he's a big human. Ah, and, yeah. Yeah. You know, and he carries the ball strong. And, you know, you overload him with defenders. He just throws a long ball or short mm. ball. So, so much to account for, but so he's, he's got that X factor. And, you know, whether they were better without him in that Challenge Cup final or not, they'll still welcome him back. They'll yeah, be happy to have him back oh, out yes. there. Do Cass have the X factor to do some damage here or not? I, I don't think there's any pressure on Cass because everyone's. I think they've had a, a very difficult year. Injuries, obviously, losing Luke Gale, their main and chief playmaker, really, has been difficult for him. And, Really hard and to Michael Shenton really as well, I think. Shenton you know, here you know. as well. And that's with a host of other injuries in between. Um, so I think they've done well to stay in the race and, and, and be up there. And they can go in a little bit like Salford, where I think at the start of the year, the expectation would have been different. Mm. Cas you know, Casford probably would have been expected to be up there. But with the difficulties along the way, I think they've done really well. And they've put themselves in a position where people won't be expecting much from them. So they, they could mm. be quite dangerous in that sense. We've uh, already spoke about championship playoffs. Toronto, everyone in agreement? Or is someone going to stick their head up? Well, I think... Well, he's thinking any, about uh, it. If, if, if anybody's going to beat Toronto, I think it... I mean, I thought Featherston played extremely well against Lee. They were outstanding Sunday. on Sunday, yeah. And if, if they can play like that against anybody, they'll be a threat, won't they, to anyone? But Toulouse... I, I didn't see the Toulouse game against York, but Toulouse, obviously, people who saw it said that they were outstanding. K Kerala uh, yeah. was mesmeric. Yeah. He was Unbelievable. Um, I do have some nice words in my vocabulary yeah. now and again. Well, I think, I think you know, Toulouse are the team that could go to Toronto and beat them. Mm. And, and you know, Toronto have lost some games at home at crucial times. I mean, Featherston went to Toronto million and beat them, didn't they? Sorry? Yeah, million pound game. Million pound game, of course. So it's not laid on for Toronto. And yeah, anybody I'd, who thinks uh, it is is foolish. What makes them dangerous is their attacking flair, mm. Toulouse. And I know that's the philosophy of their coach. He's done a great job with them, Silver Norris mm. and... No, they just don't hold back. Mm -hmm. And that'll be the danger for teams playing against them. And as you say, it's, I don't think they'll be one-way traffic. I think Toronto will be the favourites to win the league and, and come up to Super League. But I think out of the other teams, I think it's for mine, it's Toulouse that are going to give them the, or pose the biggest threat to them. Yeah, I think in my experience playing against them um, and coaching against them, if they're their quartet of Robin, Corella, Ford, Who's the other guy I was thinking of? Um, I like the back rower. Bell. Oh, Bell. Bell, yeah. yeah. I think, and oh, Reese Curran, you're probably talking about. Yeah, he's outstanding, but, yeah. We'll call it five then. I think if them five blokes can click and, and they're on top of their game, they, there is a chance of an upset because they, when they play playing well and confident, they're very difficult to contain. A couple of smart, really smart players in there. So mm. it'd be an interesting game if that's how it pans out when it, when it comes just, to Just very quickly, I've got a long way, but the Brian McDermott factor, is, does that tip it for Toronto? It goes a long way. You know, it helps him his experience in big games, and again, what he's been able to do as a coach in, in the playoff system, and whether he's going to calm them or pick them up, whatever he's going to need, he'll mm -hmm. he'll have the right feel. Mm. He'll know what's required at the time, and he'll get the sense of and the read on how his team are going and how they're mm -hmm. training and how he's got to lead them. He'll he'll know what's required at the time. So, yeah, his experience of what he's done at Leeds. Yep. in those big games, that'll be a big factor Certainly for knows them. how to win big games, doesn't he? That's the point. He, does. he, definitely, he, knows, he definitely. knows what they need. Well, that's what we're going to have to wrap up on, I'm afraid. We have run out of time for this week's show. A big thanks to my guests, Martin, Willie and Simon. We'll be back for another edition next week. But for now, goodbye. <laughs>